Good afternoon and welcome to the OR Today webinar series. We're excited to have over 220 registered attendees for today's webinar. Just a reminder that our fourth annual OR Today Live Surgical Conference takes place this Sunday, the 26th until the 28th in Nashville, Tennessee. Join us to discover new opportunities, broaden your knowledge and exchange ideas. It's not too late to register. You can save $50 on registration by using the promo code LASTCHANCE. That's L-A-S-T-C-H-A-N-C-E. So visit ortodaylive.com for more information. Let's kick off today's webinar by giving an OR Today Live surprise pack to the attendees that can tell me the answer to the following trivia question. Sunday is National Dog Day. What is the name of Charlie Brown's pet beagle in the comic strip Peanuts? Answer now using the questions feature on your dashboard. While you're answering, I want to remind you today's webinar is eligible for one continuing education hour. To obtain your certificate, you must complete the post-webinar survey, which will appear immediately on your computer screen at the end of today's call. One lucky attendee will have the opportunity to win an Amazon gift card, courtesy of OR Today, just for completing the survey. Okay, and let's see who the winner of OR Today Live Surprise Pack is. And it is, let's see, Alison Shelton. I hope I pronounced that correction correctly. Correct. Congratulations, Alison. The correct answer is Snoopy. OR Today would like to thank our sponsor, 3M Healthcare. We apply 3M science to deliver safe and effective solutions that improve patients' lives. Visit go.3m.com forward slash prep check for more information. Our presenter today is Anna Seipert. Anna is a clinical specialist with 3M Infection Prevention Division and has been a nurse for over 20 years. Anna, you may begin whenever you are ready. Thank you, Linda. Hello, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. It is my pleasure to present to you a CE presentation, which you will receive one contact hour or actually one CE hour, uh, do you have skin in the game, the high stakes of SSIs? As disclosure is, I am an employee of 3M Healthcare Business Group. Uh, 3M1 has one of the largest infection prevention divisions in healthcare. I am a clinical specialist, and that is the disclosure. Our objectives, we're gonna examine the relationship between micro, microbial cells and human cells, recognize the financial and personal impact of surgical site infections, explain the CDC's conceptual formula for SSI risk in relation to patient and process variables, describe the considerations for surgical skin prep selection, and discuss the importance of creating a sterile surface to help manage the risk of surgical site infections. So let's look at surgical site infections. Surgical site infections are a huge burden on healthcare providers and patients. Surgical site infections occur in all countries. While the rates vary between developed and developing countries, the impact is far reaching. There's significant direct and indirect costs associated with surgical site infections. Direct costs include increased length of stay, readmission, additional interventions, nursing care, and treatment costs. And in the US, loss of revenue from denied reimbursement because it is considered a hospital acquired condition or an HAI. Indirect costs include, but not limited to, loss of productivity, patient satisfaction, and unfortunately, litigation. Finally, and, and most importantly, the impact on a patient's life can be significant, and at times life-threatening and even deadly. This information confirms what, while we take great strides in being able to reduce surgical site infections, there's still a great amount of work to be done. So why do we wear gloves during surgery? We scrub our hands during, uh, before surgery uh, to remove bacteria, but we still wear gloves to prevent residual bacteria and regrowth on our hands from getting into the incision and causing an infection. So why wouldn't we take those same precautions with the patient's skin? What about the patient's skin that makes it a risk factor in the development of SSIs? To begin to answer these questions, it's helpful to have an understanding of microbial cells and the human microbiome. Excuse me, biome. 
You may be familiar with the term human, human microbiome or what the National Institute of Health calls human microbiome project. It's a relatively new field of study around the microbial communities associated with the human body. Microbial communities that live in our bodies and on our bodies and the roles that they play in human health and disease. What we've learned through this project is that microbial cells outnumber us three to one Recent estimates suggest that the human body is made of about 37 trillion human cells. And most of those cells include uh, bacteria, uh, viruses, fung fungi, and et cetera. The biodome is a dynamic community and different conditions, pardon me, and different conditions um, show that the numbers it's one constant is true is that the microbiome is, is big, but the number of microorganisms, the total volume will diverse and be genetically diversive. Microbial cells reside in three general areas of our body, the skin, the mouth and the gut. The gut being the largest and of course the skin being the most uh, covering our entire body. Why this is important uh, in this discussion is because performing surgery is a situation that causes a disruption in our normal conditions, i.e. the skin, and disrupts our intact skin, which is one of our greatest defenses against infection. So SSIs occur in 2 to 5% of our patients undergoing inpatient surgery. And research shows us that up to 60% of SSIs may be preventable by use of evidence-based guidelines. I challenge all of us to work towards a goal of 100%. But first, I'd like to suggest an interesting review of biology. Since SSIs are now the most common HAI or hospital acquired infection and also associated with the most cost, they're also the most devastating for our patients. We would all agree that we cannot put a price on quality of life. So when we look at what the body, skin can cover over a million bacteria per square centimeter and it can take just as few as 10 of those micro microbes to cause a surgical site infection. So when we look at reducing the number of microorganisms, there are some things that we can control. And I like this slide because it gives a sense of empowerment to us as clinicians. So when we look at the risk of SSI, we look at the dose of the bacteria times the virulence or the strength of the bacteria over the resistance of the host. The things that we can control or manage are the dose of the bacteria and the resistance of the patient. So let's look at some of those areas that are manageable or controllable. When we look at age, nutritional status, diabetes, smoking and nicotine use, steroid use, obesity, core body temperature, hemoglobin saturation, Coexistent infections at a remote body site, meaning a secondary site that's infected, colonization, colonization with microorganisms, and altered immune system and length of perioperative or preoperative stay. The things that we can affect or manage are the diabetes, core body temperature, hemoglobin saturation or hemodynamics, and colonization with microorganisms. The things that actually are, in essence, uh, a process variable, these are also, uh, goodness, we're, we're so happy to know this, this will help reduce the dose of the bacteria, and these are things that we can manage or control. Very importantly, there are evidence-based prevention strategies to reduce the risk of SSIs. So we look at patient preparation. Antiseptics that are involved in the showering, uh, either day of surgery or bathing the night before, oral decontamination, nasal decolonization, hair removal, remember we clip instead of shave, uh, skin preparation and draping, antimicrobial prophylaxis, surgical wound management, and then we look at what the clinical staff preparation can involve, surgical hand forearm antisepsis, hand hygiene, and surgical attire. Surgical technique includes hemostasis, failure to obliterate dead space, of tissue trauma. And then again, the hospital environment is a, in an area that we can affect or manage to reduce dose of bacteria. We have OR ventilation, OR surfaces, OR traffic flow, microbiological sampling, 
reprocessing of surgical instruments, and sterile field management. So the CDC has provided us with a conceptual model. And in this model, we're going to hypothetically just insert a number, any number. Four just happens to be the number that we're using in this uh, particular slide. So let's look at the dose of bacteria as being, say, a number four. And let's look at the virulence of that bacteria being also a number four. And let's look at the patient number as being four. So when we say 16 over four is four, that's the number. That's just a conceptual number that helps us to understand how we can do, reduce bacteria uh, dosages and also manage patient resistance. So if we're able to reduce the dose of bacteria, say to a two, and again, we cannot affect the virulence of that bacteria uh, per se, it's going to present to us in, in the form and the strength that it's, it's that it has. But when we look at the resistance of the patient, we can reduce two times four, which is eight over four. And that gives us, by essence, we're cutting that, hopefully, as a conceptual model, we're cutting that number in half. So reducing the contamination level will definitely consequently reduce the risk of infection. But because we cannot predict who will get an infection, because each patient has a unique immune system, each patient has different risk factors, surgery is different for each patient, bacteria has different levels of virulence or strength, and bacteria causes and may form biofilms, which makes it harder to eradicate or penetrate. Therefore, whatever we can control through prevention and standardization should be done to reduce the risk of infection and ensure the best outcome for each patient. So how can we reduce, reduce contamination from the patient's own skin? We look at proper selection and application of surgical skin antisepsis or antiseptics, and we protect the incision against microbial contamination by establishing a sterile surface. So let's look at surgical preps. The history of surgical preps includes uh, our English surgeon, Joseph Lister. Many of you are probably familiar with the product Listerine. Uh, going back to the early 1900s, um, Joseph actually introduced the first antiseptic that was used during surgery. Before that, not so much was done to prepare the skin. Today, there's a variety of skin antiseptic solutions, thankfully, but again, no one antiseptic can be used universally. So let's define what a surgical skin prep is. It's an antiseptic solution applied to the skin to remove soil and transient microorganisms that include bacteria at the surgical site. Reducing bacteria at the surgical site may help reduce surgical site infection. And effective skin antiseptics rapidly and persistently, very important, rapidly and persistently remove transient microorganisms and reduce resident, meaning what's living on the skin, to subpathogenic, meaning going down into the dermis with minimal skin and tissue irritation. The good news is that we can start to prepare the skin for skin antiseptics preoperatively. Uh, the guidelines from ARN in 2017 suggest that we should, have guide, uh, we should significantly reduce microorganisms on intact skin. It should contain non-irritating antimicrobial preparations. It should be by broad spectrum, it should be fast acting, and again, it should have persistent activity. Persistence is an important phrase. It actually in, in implies and in, in place it will help keep the bacteria load to its lowest acceptable level. Since we're not able to sterilize skin, we're looking for the lowest bacteria load or log before that grows back to or contaminates back to its baseline. That is what persistence is. Additional information is that it will kill bacteria by attacking multiple cell processes. Again, whether it's the cell wall or it's in as far as the protein of the cell, non-toxic at relatively high concentrations. Again, remembering that we're placing this on the patient's skin. It's relatively inexpensive and it's resistance. Um, again, being good antibiotic stewards, we wanna be sure that it doesn't create or form resistance. So when we look at antiseptic fundamentals, we know that there's some basic antiseptics that have been out there for some time. One of them is alcohol. One of them is iodine or iodophore. There's chlorhexidine gluconate or CHG. And then many times a lot, uh, 
there's a combination of these products. So let's look at alcohol. It's the oldest antiseptic. It's been around for centuries. It has a rapid broad spectrum antimicrobial activity, denatures the cell wall proteins, but there is no persistence, meaning that it's a quick kill, the bacteria will grow back or come to the surface immediately. Concentration determines the effectiveness, so we relatively have to have a range between 60 to 95%, which has some drying and some damaging qualities to the skin. Um, isopropyl alcohol is the most commonly used, and ethyl alcohol, uh, let me back up, isopropyl alcohol is most commonly used in our skin preps, and ethyl alcohol, because it's a little bit kinder to the skin, is most, mostly what we'll use in our hand sanitizers and hand scrubs. Again, the irritation increases with the higher concentration. So let's look at iodine. Its history dates back to about 170 years ago. It's a broad spectrum antimicrobial activity. Uh, it, it is very irritating to the skin. So many times you'll have a process in place that changes the iodine to an iodophore, which helps it to be a little bit more kind to the skin. Iodophores, again, were developed to minimize the side effects while maintaining efficacy. So when we look at iodophore, for, in, for instance, your povidone iodine, it's introduced in the 60s. It has the same antimicrobial activity and mechanism of action as iodine, but it's less irritating. Generally, it's an iodine and water soluble polymer. Uh, it slowly reduce, reduces, uh, excuse me, it slowly releases in the, uh, the iodine onto the skin. And again, for that reason, it may take a little longer to apply, uh, sometimes as long as five minutes. So we have chlorhexidine gluconate. It was introduced in 1950s. It's a good broad spectrum antimicrobial coverage. It disrupts the cell membrane and precipitates the cytoplasm. It binds to the protein in the stratum cornin, the layer of the epidermis, leaving a persistent residue. Again, important persistent residue and residual effect. And with repeated use, it further reduces bacteria. The typical concentrations are a half percent to four percent. So when we look at dual active antiseptic products, the most common are your iodine uh, povacrylex and isopropyl alcohol, povidone iodine and isopropyl alcohol, or chlorhexidine gluconate CHG and isopropyl alcohol. And just to quote Aristotle, it's important that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And I would agree with our dual active antiseptics, that is very true. So let's look at our governing bodies and what their statements are on preoperative skin antisepsis. When we look at our infection governing bodies, such as SHA and IDSA, we want to wash and clean the skin around the incision site. Use a dual agent skin preparation containing alcohol, unless contraindication exists. Our CDC guideline, perform intraoperative skin preparation with an alcohol-based antiseptic, unless contraindicated. This is a category 1A, strong recommendation, high quality evidence. With ARN, we know the recommendation Recommendation is three. The collective evidence indicates that there's no one antiseptic that is more effective than another for preventing SSIs. And then our National Quality Forum, Safe Practice number 22, states preoperatively using solutions that contain isopropyl alcohol as skin antiseptic preparations until other, and other alternatives have been proven as safe and effective, meaning that's our best guidelines that we have to work with. Those are our best products, products that have an isopropyl alcohol base. And again, allowing for drying time. Most preparations, minimum three minute drying time on hairless or clipped skin. None of these state that one antiseptic agent is preferred over another. So we have many considerations for selection of preps, but ideally the most commonly used patient skin preps must meet regulatory criteria for immediate microbiome microbial kill and persistent antimicrobial activity, meaning it will last. It's important to look at other factors that may affect performance when choosing a PrEP. And again, remember there is not one PrEP that will meet all prepping needs. So let's look at how we choose or select our PrEPs. We have some baseline considerations. We have patient factors, active ingredients, and a size of the area being prepped. So we wanna ask, does the patient have any allergies or sensitivities? Is the patient under two months of age? Is the skin intact? Where is the surgical procedure site? I sounded like I didn't know where, where is the surgical procedure site? <laughs> what are the active ingredients in the prep? 
does the procedure involve prepping a large surface area? Again, when you have to prep a large surface area, you want to really take into consideration the size of your applicator. So additional considerations are ability to maintain antimicrobial effectiveness. Certainly you want to look at the length of your surgery, but more, and more than likely it has to do with those uh, considerations that we just went over, the patient's allergies or sensitivities, the age of the patient, the in, is the skin intact, what is the procedure, where is the procedure, what are the active ingredients, and are we prepping a large area? We also want to look at why the need for protection doesn't end when the surgery ends. Most hospitals are some of the most contaminated environments. I know that's not an eye-opener for many of us, but it's just a hard it's hard to read that. Um, but we go to the hospital for care, but in fact are exposed to many microorganisms. Again, going back to hospital acquired uh, organisms and infections. Um, the risk of cross contamination, unfortunately, is very high. So in the outpatient area, patients are going home much sooner. So we want to get patients going home quickly. There's less clinical monitoring oversight, though, once they do leave, and there's uncontrolled home environments. Um, so even though we're getting them up and out and onto their way and out of that environment, which may be more high risk, we're actually um, not able to monitor or have oversight once they leave. And again, competence and compliance of the person caring for the wound care uh, for the wound post-operative is incredibly important. So there's a saying in nursing that discharge starts at the time of admission. And I do believe that this would be one of those, those situations where we have to look at the big picture and sending the patient home, preparing them in advance for what those skills and what those that information might need to be upon discharge. Ultimately, protecting their surgical wound post-surgery is more important than ever. So after you prep the skin, skin and start surgery, it's important that prep stays on the skin and continues to provide protection. Not all preps are created equal. Some preps are water soluble, which means that they can easily be washed or rubbed off in surgery. Some preps are water insoluble, which means they remain on the skin throughout the surgery and thereafter. If prep is removed, then it is no longer working and providing antimicrobial protection for the patient. So it's important as clinicians, we understand that preps vary in their ability to remain on the skin, whether they're water soluble or water insoluble, and how long they do offer uh, antimicrobial efficacy. If they do stay on the skin, uh, it can be anywhere from 48 hours, um, which is about the standard. Uh, not all skin preps perform to the same level under surgical cons considerations or conditions. We have to look at those challenges um, that remove our prep, irrigation, wiping, dabbing, uh, bodily fluids such as blood and manipulation, especially on our orthopedic patients. So big, the biggest culprits though are the irrigation and, and the constant wiping. Um, and manipulation. Additional considerations when choosing a sur surgical prep could include also, as I mentioned, how long does the antimicrobial persistence last? So when we talk again about it, it's the time that we, the kill factor in the initial antisepsis, and then how long does it take for those, anti for those microbes to grow back to the baseline level? So since most surgical room, again, surgical room wounds Generally, it's about 48 hours uh, that it takes for them to seal up, um, but they can take up to 96 hours to seal following surgery. So 48 hours for a wound to heal is an average, but many factors impact the time to seal. Again, patients with comorbidities, their age, weight, smoking, because smoking uh, denies uh, oxygen into the tissue, so that impairs uh, sealing and healing processes. Um, the environment that they're going home into, are they in a very humid environment? Um, do they work outside? Are they going to be exposed to uh, extreme heat or cold? Um, all of these things can affect sealing time. And again, the average time required can be as short as 24 hours, but it can be as many as 96 hours. So the type of closure, is it fully closing, partially closing? Are we packing the wound? Can also affect the sealing time, uh, sometimes beyond that 96 hour. So the length, length of the antimicrobial persistence is important when choosing a surgical prep. Again, other considerations would be in choosing a surgical prep include an incised drape. Are we using them? And what an incised drape does is it actually uh, sort of 
keeps the microbes in place, if you will, and doesn't allow them or minimizes their ability to, uh, to migrate into the to incision into the womb. So we ask the questions, why does the incised drape adhesion matter? When a drape lifts, it allows for bacteria to be transferred into the womb. And in the Alexander study, drape lift was associated with a six-fold increase in SSIs, meaning when that drape lifts, microbes or germs are allowed to migrate into that incision site much, much more quickly and much more effectively. So when we talk about the prep you use, it can dramatically affect the ability of an incised drape to adhere well to the skin. Many different types of active ingredients are used in the various surgical skin preps that are currently available. Again, going back to alcohol, povidone iodine, CHG, and iodine of overcrylex. Formulations of the skin prep can affect how well the incise sticks to the skin. So some preps actually improve adhesion while others interfere with adhesion and lead to increase, increased drape lift. Again, that goes back to water soluble versus water insoluble and whether there's a polymer. So your choice of skin prep matters when using your incised drapes. Additional considerations, ability to see the skin in all skin tones. Um, we're a multicultural society, which is a very good thing. When we come into the OR with our patient uh, and we're prepping their skin, we have to be able to see the, where we've placed the prep and how when it's dried, uh, do we create our margins and, and, and able to see where all sterile uh, field will be up and above or up below, we need to see the parameters and how far out we've extended uh, our prepping. And so the ability to see it on all skin tones is very tantamount to our ability to see if we've, uh, for lack of a better phrase, missed a spot or if we ex expanded it out long, uh, far enough in the circle so that we have full and complete coverage of our surgical site area. So less than 50% uh, of all surgeons could identify correctly the adequacy of skin preparation on medium dark to dark skin pigmentation uh, when highlight orange was used. And again, even tinted preps can be difficult to see on even some of the lighter skin tones, but as skin tones are more medium to dark to dark, we have a little bit of a difficulty in seeing where our preps have been uh, applied and how far out they've been extended. So why does visibility matter? You don't want to miss a spot again. If you do, an island of bacteria is left on the skin. The bacteria can get into the incision and increase the risk of infection. So again, select a prep that is most visible on the patient's skin. We look at dripping, running, and pooling for many reasons. The main reason why is because it becomes a fire hazard. If our preps are not dried. Remember that alcohol base, anywhere from 60 to 95 percent, generally around the 60 to 70 percent, it's a fire hazard until it's dry. So if we have dripping, running, or pooling to the side of the patient, if we've not used drapes uh, to catch that, then we unfortunately have a very high risk area for flammability. Also, the patient's skin is, is compromised if we have wetness sitting on the skin throughout the surgery. So when we look at uh, how application affects safety and efficacy, we can look at our guidelines again. AR, ARNs is protect. Sheets, padding, position equipment, and adhesive tapes should be protected from dripping or pooling of skin antiseptics beneath or around the patient. Removal of materials that are saturated with the skin antiseptic before the patient is draped. How do we apply our preparation? Is it a scrub? Is it a paint? So again, technique is very, very important. We have to follow manufacturer's instructions completely. Um, sometimes it's a back and forth stroke. So we have to look at actual technique. And again, drying time. A minimum of drying time on clipped or dry skin um, is about three minutes our hairless skin. And if we have hairy skin or skin that has a lot of hair, um, it could be up to an hour and beyond. So we need to know our drying times. Uh, other considerations when choosing a surgical prep, uh, again, we want to look at the ability to maintain antimicrobial effectiveness, how long the antimicrobial persistence uh, is, whether it's uh, 24 hours, 96 hours, uh, whether you're using an incised drape and the importance of adhesion, ability to see on off skin tones so we don't effectively miss a spot. Um, and then again, dripping, running, and pooling. We need to look at our safety considerations when we're applying our antisepsis and antiseptic uh, preps for that reason.
So when we look at creating a sterile surface, again, we go back to the question, why do we wear gloves before, uh, excuse me, during surgery? We scrub our hands before, but we still wear gloves. And again, let's look at how we're applying that standard of care to the patient's skin. So when we look at a sterile field versus a sterile surface, a sterile surface cannot be created on the skin until the sterile field has been established. We start by applying an effective surgical prep to reduce as much bacteria on the skin as possible. Surgical drapes are then placed to create the sterile field on the patient's surrounding table and mayo stand. So when you look at the little yellow area to the right of the, the illustration here, that is what we're talking about. Surgical drapes are the way that we create create a sterile field on the patient and the surrounding tables. So the sterile field is now established. What does it take to create a sterile surface on the patient's skin? Remember, the skin is never sterile. Skin prep reduces as much bacteria on the skin as possible. However, antiseptics work primarily on the skin's surface, not in the deep layers of the skin. There's always going to be residual microbes that survive on the skin surface in the deeper skin layers and in the hair follicles. According to a study, CHG in skin preps does not penetrate into the deep layers of the skin. Below a depth of 300 microns, CHG concentration may not be effective for killing bacteria. So when we look at our risk of contamination, without additional protection, residual bacteria on the skin surface and bacteria from the hair follicles that migrate to the skin surface, we can pick up items that touch the skin from our gloves, instruments, sponges, saline, bodily fluids, and we can transfer them right into the incision, again, increasing the patient's risk of infection. So again, when we talk about creating a sterile surface, we're applying the same standard of care to the patient's skin as we do our hands, and it requires creating the sterile surface. The first step is use an effective surgical prep to reduce as much bacteria on the skin as possible. Place the surgical drapes to create a sterile field. When appropriate, add a sterile incised drape to create the sterile surface. An antimicrobial incised drape can create a sterile surface all the way to the wound edge to increasing the risk of residual microbes being transferred into the incision. An incised drape is a sterile plastic film coated with adhesive that is placed on the skin over the incision area. An incised drape immobilizes residual bacteria on the skin and helps prevent the items in surgery from touching the skin and transferring bacteria into the incision. Antimicrobial incised drapes containing iodine in the adhesive helps kill residual bacteria under the drape. So the good news is that we have new evidence in the fight against infection. Skin penetration of skin preps and iodine impregnated inside, drape, inside stripes. So in a recent ex vivo study on human skin, the iodine in an iodine impregnated surgical incised drape was shown to be present at concentrations effective against methyl resistance, MRSA, at a depth of 1,000 microns. Remember, our CHG can only go basically as deep as 300. But with an iodine impregnated surgical incised drape, we can go to the depth of a thousand microns into the deeper layers of the skin where the hair follicles are present. Using an incised drape was shown to be significantly more effective at reducing microbial contamination versus using no drape. In a study done by Resipor, incised draping reduces the rate of contamination of the surgical site during hip surgery, prospective randomized trial. And basically what this is, it was a randomized clinical studies of patients undergoing hip preservation uh, surgery with the use of antimicrobial incised drapes versus not using an incised drape showed. So antimicrobial incised drapes was significantly more effective at reducing antimicrobial, excuse me, microbial wound contamination at the incision site compared to not using. At surgery end, 12% of incisions with antimicrobial incised drapes and 27.4% of incised without were positive for bacteria. So this goes back to minimizing risk. Obviously, there's not one zero. We cannot, at this point, we cannot take it down to zero, but we can at least more than cut it in half. And when we're controlling for preoperative colonization, other factors, patients without incised drapes were significantly more likely to have bacteria at the incision than patients with antimicrobial incised drapes. So again, we're looking at reducing our risks of our patients 
And one way we can is to protect and to create that sterile surface. Clinical studies show that an iodine impregnated drape can help reduce the risk of infection as well as reduce overall cost. We're all interested in keeping costs down. We want to get the job done, we want to get it done right, but we're also looking at cost. So Bianco out of Italy, uh, they did a comparison of efficacy and cost of iodine impregnated drapes versus a standard drape in a cardiac surgery, which is again one of our highest risk, most vulnerable population. It was a retrospective study study of 5,100 patients undergoing cardiac surgery with an iodine impregnated drape. And they found the iodine impregnated drape uh, was associated with a significant reduction, 71% in the overall incidence of SSIs when compared with the use of anti or non-antimicrobial -anti incised drapes. The cost savings was a direct patient-related care delivering overall co cost savings of 828,000 or about $1,025 per patient. In the Yoshimura uh, study, we, we looked at plastic iodophore drape during liver surgery, um, using iodophore impregnated adhesive drapes to prevent wound infection during high-risk surgery. It was a retrospective study involving liver resection surgery. Uh, plastic iodophore incised drapes compared with no incised drapes at all was associated with significant reduction in postoperative wound infections, 12 to 3, which is uh, quite a significant 174 patients and 122 patients. And I believe that this was um, significant. This was done in uh, 2003. So we've been very aware of the effectiveness of creating a sterile surface. And again, we're looking at the ingredients that are impregnated into these drapes um, to look at efficacy and also at our rate of reduction. So when we look at summarizing skin in the game and asking ourselves, do we, do we have skin in the game as clinicians? We can say a few things uh, pretty confidently. We now know for sure that SSI is the most common and costly hospital-acquired infection. We know that the patient as a host is an important consideration for SSI risk. We can control variables that reduce bacteria load. And we know that effective use of surgical skin prep and creation of a sterile surface can help reduce the risk of SSI. So I'm leaving on the screen uh, my contact information, and I want you to feel comfortable reaching out to me with any questions that you may have. And I'll hand it back over to Linda. Okay, thanks very much, Anna. Well, Anna is now going to talk about and answer some questions that you'll be able to find in the webinar workbook, which is available to download from your dashboard. I did chat out a message earlier about it, so hopefully you've all managed to do that. So, Anna, I will hand back to you for the skin in the game questions. Thank you, Linda. Okay, so these questions are true or false. And they basically refer to the material that we just looked at. Um, I do want to offer uh, in advance that if anyone would like the presentation in a PDF form, to please just reach out to me and I'll be uh, happy to get that to you. Also, if you have, as I mentioned, additional questions that were not addressed uh, with the material, certainly feel free to add, send those to me or to send them uh, to Linda. Um, and the tech in the uh, through your workbook or through your online uh, to OR today, and we'll certainly get an answer. To you as soon as as soon as possible. So, and I believe that yes, we do know that's true. Uh, again, at this time, AJIs are the most common. Unfortunately, the most common uh, AJI. Number two, most surgical site infections are caused by A, contamination from the environment, B, contamination from patient's own skin, C, contamination from surgical instruments, and D, contamination from break and sterile technique. And the answer is B, uh, it's contamination from patient's own skin, uh, from the nose and the oral mucosal cavities. My apologies, these are true or false and or um, actually A, B, or C, D questions. I apologize for that. Uh, number three, the conceptual equation for determining surgical site infection risk involves three components, which are A, nasal antisepsis, oral care, pre-op patient warming, B, age, 
weight, nutritional status, C, dose of bacteria, virulence or strength of bacteria, and resistance of the host, or D, all of the above? The answer is C, dose of bacteria, strength of bacteria, resistance of the host. That goes back to our CDC a conceptual model, and we're looking at what we can affect and what we can control, which would be that dose of bacteria, and again, managing the resistance of the host. True or false? Reducing the dose of bacteria on the patient's skin doesn't impact the risk of the patient developing an SSI. The answer is false. Number five, true or false? A surgical skin prep is an antiseptic solution applied to the skin to remove soil and transient microorganisms, including bacteria, at the surgical site. And the answer is true. Number six, what is a dual active antiseptic? It's a an antiseptic that takes twice as long to apply, an antiseptic that is a two-step application, or an antiseptic that combines two active ingredients? And the answer is an antiseptic that combines two active ingredients. Number seven, true or false? There is no one prep that will meet all prepping needs. And the answer is true. It goes back to us doing a proper assessment of our patient's allergies, our location of the surgery, and all the things that we need to weigh in to find what is the appropriate antiseptic for our patient. Number eight, what are considerations for selecting a surgical skin prep? A, patient age, allergies, and surgical procedure location. B, the prep's ability to maintain antimicrobial effectiveness. C, the PrEP's hours of antimicrobial persistence, or D, all of the above? And the answer is D, all of the above. Number nine, which of the following choices are accurate regarding how to create a sterile surface for a surgical procedure? A, clean the skin, sterilize the skin prior to surgery by applying a surgical PrEP and applying sterile drapes. Or B, apply a surgical PrEP, allow the PrEP to dry, use sterile drapes to create the sterile field, and apply a sterile incised drape? The answer is B, apply a surgical prep, allow the prep to dry, use sterile drapes to create the sterile field, and apply a sterile incised drape, and that allows and creates a sterile surface. True or false, number 10, an antimicrobial incised drape can create a sterile surface all the way to the wound edge, decreasing the risk of residual microbes being transferred into the incision area. And the answer is true. And that concludes the question and answer part of the presentation. I appreciate and uh, very much want to thank all of you for your time. Okay, thank you. Thank you for a great webinar and, uh, and very informative, in fact. Um, and thanks once again to our sponsor, 3M. Uh, just a reminder that one lucky attendee today will win an Amazon gift card for completing the post-webinar survey, which will appear on your screen shortly. Uh, for information on our upcoming OR Today webinars, please visit our website, ortoday.com forward slash webinars. Once again, thank you all for attending this afternoon. Um, hope you have a great rest of the day and hope to see you next time.